Hi friends, I am Krishna Kumar, Assistant Professor at School of Law, Dr. Hari Singh Gaur Vishwadhyale, Sagar, Madhya Pradesh. Today in this lecture, for the students of Bachelor of Arts, we will discuss and have an overview of Indian Evidence Act 1872. The whole topic is divided into six modules as module 1 introduction, module 2 oral and documentary evidence, module 3 public and private documents and the presumptions as to the documents, module 4 of exclusion of oral by documentary evidence, module 5 burden of proof, module 6 witnesses and their examination, module 7 conclusion. Module 1 Introduction We have discussed in the Indian Evidence Act Part 1 about the definitions defined in Section 3, the relevancy of the facts ranging from Section 5 to 55. Now, in this Part 2nd, we will discuss about the rest of the parts of Indian Evidence Act 1872, that is Part 2nd and Part 3rd ranging from Section 56 to 167. Part 2 of the Act titled On Proof ranges from section 56 to section 100. It deals with oral and documentary presumptions as to the documents and exclusion of oral evidence by documentary evidence. Part 3 of the Act titled Production and Effect of Evidence ranges from section 101 to section 167, deals with the burden of proof estoppel, witnesses, examination of witnesses and improper admission and rejection of evidence. Module 2 Oral and Documentary Evidence As we have gone through in the Indian Evidence Act Part 1 about the general rule that all facts in issue and relevant facts must be proved by evidence either oral or documentary. This rule has two exceptions as a facts judicially noticeable section 56 and 57, b facts admitted section 58. Section 56 lays down that the facts judicially noticeable need not be proved and section 57 deals with the 13 facts of which the court is bound to take judicial notice while section 58 lays down that the facts admitted by the parties need not to be proved, oral and documentary evidence. There are two methods of proving a fact, one by producing witness of fact, oral evidence and the other by producing a document which records the fact in question, documentary evidence. Section 59 provides that all facts except the contents of documents may be proved by oral evidence while section 60 provides that if a fact is to be proved by oral evidence, the evidence must be of a person who has directly perceived the facts which he testifies or has the personal knowledge of the facts that is oral evidence must be direct. Section 61 says that the contents of the document may be proved either by primary or by secondary evidence, primary and secondary evidence. Section 62, primary evidence means the document itself produced for the inspection of the court where a document is in several parts, each part is primary evidence. If executed in counterparts, each counterpart is primary evidence, where documents are made by one uniform process that is printing, lithograph or photography, each is primary evidence of the contents of the documents. Section 63, secondary evidence means and includes firstly certified copies of the original documents, secondly copies made from the original by mechanical process which assures the accuracy of the copy. Thirdly, 
copies made from or compared with the original. Fourthly, counterpart of a document against the party who did not sign it. Fifthly, oral account of the contents of a document given by a person who has seen himself the document etc. Section 64 provides that the document is to be proved by its primary evidence except in the cases provided in section 65 as firstly when the original is shown or appear to be in possession or power of person against whom the document is sought to be proved adversary party or of any person out of reach of or not subjected to the process of the court or of any person legally bound to produce it does not produce it despite due notice under section 66. Secondly, when the original document is lost or destroyed. Thirdly, when the original is of such a nature as not to be easily movable. Fourthly, when original is public document then under 74, section 74 etc. Then secondary evidence of the contents of the document is admissible unless some legal excuse is sought for the non-production of primary evidence is sought. Section 65A and 65B provide for the admissibility of electronic records in evidence while section 67 provides for the proof of signature and handwriting of person and section 67A provides for the proof of digital signature. Module 3 public and private documents and the presumptions as to documents. Section 74 provides for the public documents and held that the following documents are public documents. Number 1, document forming the acts or records of the acts. Firstly, of the sovereign authority that is the parliament and legislature of states. Second of official bodies and tribunals and third of public officers legislative judicial and executive of any part of india or of the commonwealth or of a foreign country second public records kept in any state of private documents the kind of documents that are mentioned in section 74 two are documents made between private parties but a record of them is kept in registration office under the registration act. For example, wills and sale deeds. Section 75 provides that all other documents are private documents. Proof of public documents. Section 76 provides that every public officer having the custody of a public document shall give on demand a copy of it on payment of legal fee to every person who has a right to inspect such document with endorsement at the foot of such copy that it is a true copy of such document and shall be signed, dated and affixed with official title and sealed. Such a copy is called a certified copy. Section 77 provides that such certified copies may be produced in proof of the contents of the public documents or part thereof, cultivation registers, registers of paddy producers prepared by village assistants are provable by secondary evidence. Section 78 deals with the proof of other official documents as number 1, central acts, orders or notifications be proved by the copies certified by the heads of departments concerned. 2. Proceedings of the legislatures are proved by journal of those bodies or copies printed by the government. 3. Proclamations, orders or regulations issued by Her Majesty or Privy Council can be proved by copies of extracts of London Gazette. 4. Foreign legislative acts be proved by journals published by foreign authority, copy certified under the seal of the sovereign of such foreign country. 5. Municipal proceedings to be proved by publications of such body certified by their legal keeper. 
6. Public documents of any other class in a foreign country may be proved by the original or certified copy issued by the legal keeper of the document with a certificate and seal of notary public or Indian consul or diplomatic agent. The presumptions as to documents section 79 to 90 deal with the presumption of documents as are founded on the premise that all acts are presumed to be rightly done. Presumption under section 79 to 85 and section 89 are compulsory that is shall presume and the judge is bound to raise the presumption in question. The presumption under section 86 to 88 and section 90 are in the discretion of the court that is may presume in the sense that the court may or may not draw the presumptions. Section 79 presumption as to genuineness of certified copies. Courts shall presume section 80 the court shall presume genuineness of documents produced as of records of evidence, deposition of witness, confessional statement of accused before judge or magistrate. Section 81. The court shall presume as to the genuineness of the gazettes, newspapers, private acts of parliament and other documents etc. Section 81a. The court shall presume the genuineness as to gazettes in electronic forms. Section 82. The court shall presume the genuineness of documents admissible in England without proof of seal or signature. Section 83. Presumption as to maps and plans issued under the authority of government. The courts shall presume their genuineness. Section 84. The courts shall presume the genuineness of collections of laws and reports of decisions of a foreign country. Section 85. Presumption as to power of attorney, electronic agreements and digital signatures shall presume. Section 86. Presumption as to certified copies of foreign judicial records. Courts shall presume. Section 87. Presumption as to books, maps and charts may presume. Section 88. Presumption as to telegraphic messages may presume. Section 89. The court shall presume due execution of documents not produced even after due notice. Section 90. Presumption as to documents of 30 years old may presume. Module 4 of exclusion of oral by documentary evidence. Where both oral as well as documentary evidence are admissible, the court may go by the evidence which seems to be more reliable. The provisions as to exclusion of oral by documentary evidence are based on the rule of best evidence. Mainly section 91 to 100 deal with it. Section 91 provides that when the terms of a contract or of a grant or of any other disposition of property have been reduced to the form of a document or is by law to be reduced to the form of a document, no evidence shall be given for the proof of the terms of such contract etc. except the primary or secondary evidence of the writing itself. Exception 1. When a public officer is required by law to be appointed in writing and when it is shown that any particular person has acted as such officer, the writing by which he is appointed need not be proved. Exception 2. Wills admitted to probate in India may be proved by the probate. Exception 3. The statement in any document whatever of a fact other than the facts referred to in this section shall not preclude the admission as to the same fact. The provisions of 91 are further supplemented by section 92 by providing that the terms of any such contract, grant or other disposition of property or any matter 
required by law to be reduced to the form of a document have been proved according to section 91 and no evidence of any oral agreement or statement shall be admitted as between the parties to any such instrument or their representatives in interest for the purpose of contradicting, varying, adding to or subtracting from its term but 1. Any fact may be proved which would invalidate any document or which would entitle any person to any decree or order relating thereto and cannot be called in question on the grounds of fraud, intimidation, illegality, want for due execution, want of capacity, want of failure of consideration or mistake in fact or law. Second, the existence of any separate oral agreements to matter on which a document is silent and which is not consistent with its terms may be proved. Third, the existence of any separate oral agreement constituting a condition precedent to the attaching of any obligation under any such contract, grant or disposition of property may be proved. Fourth, the existence of any separate oral agreement constituting a condition precedent to the attaching of any obligation under any such contract, grant or disposition of property may be proved except in cases in which such contract, grant or disposition of property is by law required to be in writing or has been registered according to the law in force for the time being as to the registration of documents. Fifth, any usage or custom by which any incidents not expressly mentioned in any contract are usually annexed to contracts of that description may be proved. Sixth, any fact may be proved which shows in what manner the language of a document is related to the existing facts. Ambiguous documents. When a document is ambiguous that is either the language does not show the clear sense of the document or its application to facts creates doubt. Section 93 to 98 comes into application and lay down the rules as to the interpretation of documents with the aid of such extrinsic evidence. Ambiguities are of two kinds. One, patent ambiguities means a defect which is apparent on the face of the document. In such cases, the oral evidence is not allowed on the face of record. Section 93, 94 deals with it. Second, latent ambiguities means a defect which is not apparent on the face of record, but in application of the language to the facts stated in it, section 95 to 97 deals with it. Section 93 provides with the exclusion of evidence to explain or amend ambiguous document, while section 94 deals with the exclusion of evidence against application of document to existing facts. Section 95 deals with the evidence as to the document when the language of a document is plain, but in its application to the existing facts, it is meaningless as to apply to those facts. Section 96 deals with the evidence as to application of languages which can apply to only one of the several persons. Section 97 provides that where the language of the document applies partly to one set of facts and partly to another, but does not apply accurately to either. Evidence can be given to show which facts the document was meant to apply. Section 98 deals with the evidence as to the meaning of illegible characters, etc. While section 99 deals with the evidence of non-parties to the document and section 100 provides savings of the provisions of Indian Succession Act as to the construction of wills. Module 5. Burden of Proof. Every judicial proceeding has for its purpose to ascertain 
some right or liability. These rights and liabilities arise out of some facts which must be proved to the satisfaction of the court. Section 101 to 111 lays down the provisions regarding who is to lead evidence and prove the case. Section 101 provides that whoever desires any court to give judgment as to any legal right or liability dependent on some facts which he asserts must prove that those facts exist. The burden of proof which means the obligation to prove a fact as under section 102 is on the person who would fail if no evidence at all were given on either side and under section 103 regarding proof as to any particular fact is on the person who wishes the court to believe in its existence. Section 104 provides for the burden of proving any fact necessary to prove in order to enable any person to give evidence of any other fact is on the person who wishes to give such evidence. While section 105 provides for the burden of proving exception in criminal case is upon the accused charged. Further, the court shall presume the absence of such circumstances. Section 106 provides for the burden of proof especially within the knowledge of any person is on the person only while section 7 provides for the burden of proving death is on the person who says so. If any question is whether a person is alive or dead and it is shown that he was alive within 30 years. Section 109 provides for the burden of proof as to certain relationship between persons as shown to have acted as partners, landlord and tenant or principal and agent. The law presumes to be so related is upon the person who says that they were never so related or have ceased to be so. Section 110 provides cases of possession of a property that the burden of proof is on the person who affirms that the person in possession is not the owner. While section 111 provide for the proof of good faith and active confidence. The court can take into consideration certain facts even without calling for the proof of them. When the court presumes the existence of a fact it is known as presumption. A thing taken for granted. These presumptions are of three kinds. First, a presumption of fact which is rebuttable as the court may presume its existence. Examples of such presumption are section 86 to 88, 90 and section 114b. Presumption of law which is rebuttable and irrebuttable, conclusive proof as the court shall presume Examples of such presumption are section 79 to 85, section 111A and C, mixed presumptions of law and fact. We have dealt with section 86 and 111 in the previous module and in present module also. So, now we will start with section 112 which provides for the presumption of legitimacy that any person was born. Number one during the continuance of a valid marriage between his mother and any man or second within 280 days after its dissolution the mother remaining unmarried is conclusive proof that he is legitimate son of that man unless it can be shown that the parties to the marriage had no access to each other at any time when he could have been begotten. In the similar manner under section 113, the proof of cessation of territory shall also be conclusive. Section 113a, the court may presume the abatement of suicide by a married woman if two conditions are satisfied. First, the suicide was committed within a period of seven years from the date of her marriage. Second, her husband or his relatives has subjected her to cruelty as defined in section 498A IPC. Under section 113B, 
the court shall presume that the person had caused the dowry death if the person had subjected her to cruelty or harassment in connection with any demand for dowry soon before her death whenever any question related to the dowry death defined in section 304b ipc is before the court section 114 also deals with the existence of facts which the court may presume relating to the common course of natural events human conduct and public and private business etc section 114a deals with the presumption in rape cases under section 376 ipc and sexual intercourse between a man and a woman was with or without consent and the woman states in the court that it was against her consent the court shall presume that there was no consent estoppel estoppel is the principle of law by which a person is held bound by the representation made by him or arising out of his conduct it is dealt under section 115 to 117 of the act section 115 contains the general principle of estoppels while section 116 and section 117 are instances of estoppel the indian contract act section 234 the specific relief act section 18 the transfer of property act section 41 and 43 are some of its examples module 6 witnesses and their examination section 118 to 121 and section 133 deal with the competency of the persons who can appear as witness a witness may be competent and yet not compelable section 118 provides that all persons are competent to testify unless incapable by reason of tender age extreme old age disease or infirmity section 19 and section 21 provides that a dumb person and judges and magistrates can also give evidence section 20 provides that husband or wife shall also be competent witness in civil proceedings against each other and in criminal proceedings against any person privileged communication in india section 122 section 123 section 124 and section 125 deal with communications during marriage as to the affairs of state official communications and the information as to commission of offences wherein no person shall be compelled to give witness section 126 to 129 of the indian evidence act 1872 deal with the privileged communication that is attached to professional communication between a legal advisor and the client section 126 and 128 mention circumstances under which the legal advisor can give evidence of such professional communication section 127 provides that the interpreters clerks or servants of legal advisor are restrained similarly section 129 says when a legal advisor can be compelled to disclose the confidential communication which has taken place between him and his client according to section 133 an accomplice who has taken part in the commission of a crime a guilty associate as partner in crime shall be a competent witness against an accused person examination of witness section 134 gives discretion to the court regarding number of witnesses to be testified before it while section 135 deal with the order of production and examination of witnesses which is to be regulated by law order 18 of cpc and the chapters 18 20 21 22nd and 28th of crpc section 137 provides for the examination of a witness by the party who calls him shall be called his examination in chief the examination of a witness by the adverse party shall be called his cross examination and the examination of a witness subsequent to the cross examination by the party who called him shall be called his re examination and section 138 provides 
that the witnesses shall be first examined in chief, then cross examined and then re examined. Section 141 provides for the leading questions as any question suggesting the answer which the person putting it wishes or expects to receive. These questions cannot be asked in examination in chief or re examination. If objected by other party except with the permission of the court, they may be asked in cross examination. Hostile witness. A hostile witness is one who from the manner in which he gives evidence shows that he is not desirous of telling the truth to the court. A witness who is gained over by the opposite party is hostile witness. The mere fact that at a session's trial, a witness tells a different story from that told by him before the magistrate does not necessarily make him hostile. This term is nowhere used in act, but section 154 provides an opportunity to ask question by party to his own witness when firstly the court may in its discretion permit the person who calls a witness to put any question to him which might be put in cross examination by the adverse party. Secondly, nothing in this section shall disentitle the person so permitted under subsection 1 to rely on any part of the evidence of such witness. Section 145 also prescribes one of the most effective modes for impeaching the credit of witness. Module 7. Conclusion. The proving of evidence is the most daunting task and how a fact is to be proved is related with the evidence law. Therefore, the topic purposely dealt with the types of evidences and their proving. It may be helpful for the audience to have an idea about the admissibility of various statements and documents in the court. It will also be of utility from the view of lawyers as well as to the students at graduation level. With all these information here, we come to the end of the today's lecture. Do keep in mind what we have discussed today. It is time for you all to do some self study. This is Mr. Krishna Kumar signing off. If you want to learn more and enhance your knowledge, you may log on to our website for MCQs, quizzes. LORs at www.cec.nic.in. Till then, goodbye.